for the link uh, being uh, difficult, there's an R at the end of Philip's Zoom link, but all the information is on that portal. So thanks for participating in our virtual experiment and your patience as we go through this process as we got a surge from about 200 registered to 850 the last moment. All right, so in terms of our schedule, so as, as we discussed in case you missed yesterday, the focus is that you know we'll have one hour together, which is what we're doing today. We'll go from 11 to noon Eastern, and then we'll give you a chance to watch the lectures that we actually had recorded in 2019 that are posted on the MIT OpenCourseWare site. And so yesterday, the focus was on how airplanes fly and how airplanes work, and there are a few lectures there. So let's touch on a couple key points there. Yeah, let me, let me interrupt for a sec. If you're having trouble remembering the link, it's, it's Mindy the Crippler. And uh, I think you can all see why. Here she is. Good pup. Okay, Tina. Good puppy. I'll, yeah. <laughs> I'll take the exam review, Tina. You can do these slides. So the four forces of flight, as you saw in the aerodynamics uh, video, you have lift, weight, thrust, and drag. This, so these forces oppose each other. If lift exceeds weight, you'll go up. If thrust exceeds drag, you'll go forward. All right, here's a practice question. So uh, you guys can feel free to unmute and shout it out. What do you think, A, B, or C? A. 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 So just as a quick recap here, you can see the cord line going through. That yellow is showing as if you were to you know, take an airplane wing and, and cut it. So you're looking at that shape of the wing. So you see the, the leading edge at the front and the trailing edge at the back. Okay, so um, we got a wide range of uh, answers to this question. Um, and therefore I thought we would uh, cover it. I think some of the variation may have had to do with people downloading uh, the POH for a different serial number. So that just is a good lesson in how precise you have to be in aviation. You know, there's minor variations of the same aircraft and legally they're gonna have a different pilot's operating handbook and slightly different speeds. So even for people who, you know, got a slightly different answer because the, there's a variant of the SR-20 that maybe has some different characteristics um, that was a good exercise. So the um, maximum speed here, as you see, is 200 uh, indicated. Uh, you know, you can't really tell what the true air speed is um, without a bunch of calculations, uh, and you can't necessarily tell what your calibrated air speed is. So as a pilot, we always talk about indicated air speed because that's what's shown on your airspeed uh, instrument. Anyway, so uh, yeah, basically 56 is the slowest you can fly with the uh, full flaps and uh, 200 is the fastest you can fly without flaps. Tina, you can question. go next. Any, any questions about that one actually? I have a question. Um, so I think the question is slightly misleading, right? What's the minimum speed with flaps? I mean, like, I guess that goes to the definition of what, it, what airspeed is, right? Like, cause I mean, I think the, you can have the, um, the flaps down below 56, right? Uh, you can have, sure, you can have the flaps down below 56 knots, but the Cirrus is telling you that, you know, there's a pretty good chance that you'll be stalling. If you don't stall at 56, you'll probably stall by 54, <clears throat> depending on the center of gravity and uh, how heavy you are. So as a practical matter, as a pilot, this is the only, these are the only data that you have. So you generally try to stay within this range. There is an angle of attack. I mean, stalling, as you have learned from Tina's lecture, you know, stalling is a phenomenon having to do with the angle of attack of the wing. And the Cirrus, like most other airplanes, has the stall warning horn that's based on angle of attack. Um, so you could also say, well, I'll keep flying until I hear the horn and then I'll recover. <laughs> yeah, but but uh, if somebody asks you, what's the slowest you can fly in the Cirrus, you know, can I hover, if somebody says, look, can I hover in the Cirrus? 
I I need to take some pictures and just hover and hang out. Uh, you know, the good, a good answer is, look, I can't fly uh, slower airspeed than 56 knots, and there's only 20 knots of winds aloft, so I can't go slower than uh, 36 knots of ground speed. D does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I guess where I get confused, I think where I got confused on this question was, I mean, like on takeoff, right, you extend flaps prior to lifting off, and so I guess that the, it's at the point where lift is generated, where I guess it's considered airspeed. That yeah, that's true. I mean, if you're on the ground, obviously you can have an airspeed of 20 knots and that's fine. All right, so, Tina, was there, I think there was one more slide. Yeah, we got some different answers to this, which um, again, I think some of the, the ones that were off a little bit by like one knot here or there, um, I think may have had to do with people downloading a different version of the manual. Um, so you can see here, uh, the, remember, uh, I think in Tina's talk, we talked about how when your CG is aft, the air, every, the airplane does everything better except, uh, stability. It becomes a little bit less stable, which might make it a little bit harder to fly if you're not on the autopilot, which of course in the series you always are. Um, but, uh, so you can see here. If you have a 30 degree bank and you're at gross weight, you can go a little bit slower without stalling if you have aft CG. Tina, can you highlight that 69 over there? Just put your cursor over it on the bottom. I think click right. Can you oh. see my cursor? Uh, yeah, you can just point your cursor. I can, we can see your cursor. Yeah, right there, 69. Oh. Okay. Ooh, thank you, Daniel. I A S and K C A S. Uh, that is a great question. So indicated airspeed is the only thing we care about as pilots. That's what we can see. Uh, calibrated airspeed. Tina might have a better perspective on this, but you know the Insta pitot tube isn't perfect. Um, so there's some engineering way of measuring. You know, if the indic if the indic if the airspeed indicator says you're going 100 knots. Um, you know, how fast are you actually going? So in this case, it shows that you're going to stall. Somebody can highlight the 70 at 30 degree bank for most forward CG. Maybe Daniel can do that again for us. Oh, Tina's got it. Uh, somebody, some clever uh, Aero Astro PhD like Tina figured out that if you're going 70 knots, if it says to the pilot you're going 70 knots, you're actually going 72 knots. Tina, do you want to have elaborate on calibrated airspeed versus indicated? No, I'll have to come back on that one. Okay. Anyway, that's the difference. But as a pilot, it's basically useless. You know, maybe the FAA can ask you about that on an exam. Uh, and it's not even how fast the airplane is going, you know, through the air as measured by GPS uh, on a calm wind day. You know, that's true airspeed. It's really just something that um, it's, it's a way of uh, figuring out how much error there is in this instrument. Um, you know, this whole instrumentation system of pitot tube and, uh, and the airspeed indicator in your cockpit. Any questions about this one? So yes. I, I, I guess, yeah, the, the, the purpose of having this here in the assignment is to remind everybody that uh, if you're in a bank, um, don't, don't fly 56 knots. <laughs> don't, don't take that 56 knot uh, number from before and uh, use it when you're in a uh, steep bank trying to make it uh, to the runway from the pattern. So on the written test, the answer would be 30 to 125 knots? Uh, no, that was, those were the answers we received. Oh yes, those are the answers we received, exactly. 30 knots uh, definitely would be uh, pretty ambitious. Um, and I don't know where they got 100, 125 knots would be like the stall speed on a fighter jet maybe. Ah, uh, okay. So, the, but the correct answer though is 69 to 70 then, depending on the CG? Yes. I mean, as a pilot, I think you would use the 70 because think about it. Most of the time you do have a more forward CG. You have, you know, two, well, if you're flying with people my age, you know, you have two fat people in the front and uh, a few bags in the back uh, and you're still at gross weight. <laughs> So, so I would say, you know, if somebody asked me this question, I would just say 70. Shouldn't you maintain like a above 10, 10 knots above the stall speed in normal flight? 
Sure. I mean, the FAA would say that to land the airplane, you never want to fly slower than 1.2 uh, times the stall speed. Um, so uh, yeah, this is not something that you would use for practice. You know, you wouldn't use the speed for practical flying. You would say, um, you know, I'm going to uh, maintain at least 1.2 times this when I'm in the pattern and uh, only think about getting down to this speed when I'm, you know, almost touching down. Great, great question. And for those who are a little bit confused about forward CG, aft CG, uh, that, that will be covered on day four in the weight and balance. And then you'll actually get to do, um, as part of the assignment, your own uh, weight and balance. So we'll ask you to put in, as if you were flying an airplane, you know, your weight, a friend's weight, and to calculate that, that CG. Okay, so here's, a, here's another question. When departing behind a heavy aircraft, how do you avoid the wake turbulence? Um, so feel free to use the, no. the chat or shout out an answer. Should be B. B, bravo. That's right. So we actually got a few different folks there. So I'm glad I put in some uh, follow-up information where you can read a little bit more. So these, um, the wingtip vortices sink below the aircraft. So basically, so let's let's think about it. So when you have an airplane uh, and you're departing behind it. Um, so behind it, it has it has wake vortices coming down and they're 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 falling down. And so if you want to, if you're in another airplane, I don't have another airplane here. You're this pen. Um, in order to avoid all of that wake turbulence behind the, the big heavy aircraft, you want to be above it because if you're above it, then you're not caught in those wake vortices. So let's do the opposite. So now let me ask you. So if you're if you're landing um, on a runway and an airplane, a big heavy airplane lands uh, before you and touches down on the runway when um, and then you know taxis off. When you're coming in to land on that same runway, do you want to touch down before where the heavy aircraft touched down or in front of where the heavy aircraft touched down? In front. In front. Yes, exactly. That would be the best way to avoid that turbulence. Good job. So um, some of the... Explain that one more time. You want to touch down on the runway in front of where the aircraft touched down because again the the turbulence will be behind the heavy aircraft so if you land ahead of where that aircraft touched down that's the best way to avoid <laughs> that turbulence like like a leapfrog yes exactly so there were a few other things in the lecture about you know learning to fly so we talked about the FAA pilot certificate um, there are a few different steps so we talked about pre-solo solo, solo um, Philip has shared that you can, when we talk about learning to fly, it doesn't have to be all the way through getting your pilot certificate. In about 10 hours of flight, you can essentially solo. And so that would be a yeah. great idea as an option. And getting your private pilot gives you a lot of options in terms of you can fly with friends and family. Um, you can actually fly at night, which is unique in the in the U.S. In other countries, um, they require an additional training, an instrument flight training or IFR to fly at night. But in the U.S., you can actually fly at night even with your VFR. So there are a lot of different certificates. So all of this was covered in the lectures. I'm just highlighting some, some key points. The, uh, the focus here is the private pilot, but there are actually other certificates you can get such as a sport pilot certificate. It has some additional restrictions, but it's a little easier to get. Um, one of the big reasons to get a sport pilot is it doesn't require the same um, medical clearance. Um, after you get your private pilot, you could actually go on to get other certifications. So you can um, most likely you're going to use a Cessna 172 or a Piper, or some kind of single engine aircraft for your private pilot. You could get a multi-engine, or you could go on to get your instrument rating or your commercial rating. Hmm. There are a lot of regulations. We covered a lot of these in the lectures. And um, when we talk about, you know, 
CFR, we mean Code of Federal Regulations, or FAR, Federal Aviation Regulations. These are uh, definitely on the exam, so you should be aware of that. Um, we had a lot of questions about the, the written exam and the expiration, so let me answer some of those. So if you look at part uh, 61.35, it talks about the requirement to have an endorsement from an instructor before you take um, different tests. And so specifically before you take the FAA written exam, you need an endorsement. And that is specifically what you will get in this class. So if you successfully complete this class, and in particular on the final FAA practice exam that you get, that you do if you get a passing score over a 70 and upload your result, Philip, who's a CFI, will actually endorse you to get to take the official FAA written exam. So there's a lot of questions about when does that expire, how long does that last. So there isn't a clear FAA regulation on an expiration, so I don't think there's a clear expiration date on that. Some folks, when they write the endorsement, actually list an expiration, but there's no official expiration on that endorsement. But the, the whole idea of it is that, you know, you've just passed a practice exam, so you do want to take the written exam relatively quickly so you don't forget everything after that, or at least you review again um, if there's a time gap. And then there was another question about, well, once you su successfully complete the FAA written exam, then how long is that valid? It's 24 calendar months. 24 calendar There's a lot more information in the presentations about you know, the level of aeronautical experience that you required. We tested on this yesterday. There's a 40 hour requirement, but most folks take about 55 hours or more. Um, we talked a lot about aircraft. There's some, uh, sorry, there's some folks, if you could just mute, that would be really helpful. Yeah, Tita, can you make me co, can, yeah, can you make me co-host and I can mute people who uh, have forgotten that they're live? <laughs> yes, you're a co-host. Thank you. Okay, sorry, Philip, I think I muted you as well. Um, and then we talked about uh, aircraft systems. So that was a really great uh, lecture talking about how, um, what the different aircraft systems are. So just as some examples, um, we talked about engines being air cooled. So this is a figure showing the air flowing over the engine, which is in the nose of an airplane. Um, earlier, before class started, we had some questions about steam gauge uh, versus a glass cockpit, which glass doesn't literally mean glass, but it's referring to an all digital display. So here's a picture of those quote unquote steam gauge um, flight instruments. So the reference is just that it looks like in a uh, you know, steam powered train, you know, this is what it looks like, but they're not in fact steam uh, powered. Um, so here are some of the main flight instruments that you use that you should be familiar with. And the lecture talked about, you know, how, how these work as well as how to detect some of the errors uh, with them. So for example, if your pitot tube gets a leaf stuck over that, how does that affect your airspeed indicator? Yeah, and, re and remember that electric is because uh, the uh, gyros used to be vacuum powered in the good old days. I guess they still are at some flight schools. So that attitude indicator in the directional gyro below it would have been driven by a vacuum pump, believe it or not. Yeah, some, some are today also. And uh, here's just one flight instrument as an example, the turn coordinator. I pulled this one up because there's a little uh, ball that kind of slides back and forth. The ball is in the middle if you're in coordinated flight, but uh, if the ball kind of goes out to the right, um, you, you want to push more on the right rudder. So the term the pilots uh, often use is step on the ball. So if the ball kind of comes out. Now when you're in a glass cockpit, there's a bar that comes out instead of a ball, a bar. And so it's step on the bar or step on the ball in order to make sure your turns are coordinated. Okay, so we had a lot of different answers. 31% uh, of people said, no, it's not legal to fly the Cirrus VFR at night if all two is inoperative. Um, so I don't understand why that is. I actually went and downloaded the POH for a newer SR-20 with the perspective avionics from Garmin, the G1000. And uh, it said the same thing. 
So I'm not sure, uh, but basically if you look at that, uh, maybe somebody can highlight that alternator two line at the bottom. Uh, it says if you're VFR at night, you don't need, uh, you don't need any yes. alternator. So who, can somebody who's one of the 31 percenters um, explain why they thought after looking at this chart that uh, the alternator two was required? Yes, so I'm actually one of the guys in the yes group, but this was a super confusing chart in terms of what on earth it actually means. <laughs> there was no description in the regulations or in the Ceres manual on what it was actually saying. What does that one refer to? Uh, it means you need one alternator one. Of course, having two would be very interesting. Um, I don't know how you would have two alternator ones in an aircraft that's uh, designed to hold only one. Um, but yeah, it says you need one battery to fly VFR, one battery one. Um, I guess if you look at the rest of the chart, there are... Uh, yeah, there were some like threes and stuff in there, but it didn't say that what the chart was saying was that you need one. It could have easily read as, oh, this is a category one operation or a category two or something, and who knows what that means. Yeah, so it's saying that you need one of those. You're right, when there's only one that could be installed in the aircraft, it would probably be better to just have a check in there. Uh, yeah, let me see, like fuel quantity indicator, for example, I'm looking at. That's uh, the fuel quantity indicator. Um, you need uh, two of those, meaning two fuel gauges, one for left, one for right tank. And then you need uh, three of the LEDs that indicate where the flaps are. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically this is just Cirrus telling you, in addition to all the FA required stuff, which I think, can we see the next slide? Philip, while you're doing that, are there oh. other documents that, uh, whereas most of this stuff is well over-specified, this was an example of an under-specified, no key, no legend. Are there other things that we should be looking for where there is a lack of key or legend? Oh, I don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to see it. I'll, I'll know it when I see it. Just like, uh, just like content that should be banned from Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. I, I, I know it when I see it. <laughs> okay, well, at least it sounds like um, the issue was just that the table was highly unclear as opposed to um, a true misunderstanding. So that's good. Um, so is the answer no or is the answer yes? Can you fly VFR at night with alternator to inoperable? Uh, the answer is um, yes, you can fly the Cirrus, according to Cirrus anyway. Uh, you because you only need one out, you only need one alternator to actually fly, because the other alternator will be working. Correct. You basically, you don't need, basic, the, the battery two and the alternator two are backups, and Cirrus is, uh, they've apparently made a judgment that if your VFR and your alternator, and your one alternator fails, um, you know, you'll have uh, maybe 20 minutes of battery power and it'll enable you to get to the nearest airport and uh, land. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go VFR over the Atlantic Ocean with one alternator. Again, just because the FAA says it's okay, it doesn't necessarily mean you should decide that that's within your uh, personal comfort zone. So we have some slides in the final lecture about um, personal minimums. Yeah, I mean, one, one area where this could be really useful is, let's say your alternator two fails and you're at an airport where it can't be fixed. Uh, do you need to get a ferry permit from the FAA or from an FAA mechanic saying, yes, it's legal to fly this aircraft on one flight to another airport where it can be repaired? Or in this case, you could just refer to the kinds of operation lists and say, okay, I can, I can take this airplane to where, it can be, to where all two can be fixed. Um, you know, just as long as it's a, a visual, uh, visual weather conditions. Exactly. And I appreciate those folks in the, in the chat helping each other out. That's what we like to see. Just for time, I'm going to move forward into performance a bit. So, um, you know, Philip's performance lecture talked a lot about, you know, what are the performance characteristics you're trying to predict? You know, takeoff distance, what is the, you know, how, what does the aircraft perform at and what things affect the ability for the aircraft to perform. It also talks about some more regulations. You see uh, 91103 here about a pre-flight, so checking all of these things in advance. So that's how you would learn, for example, that your alternator was inoperative by doing these checks and understanding the status of your aircraft before flying. 
uh, here effects of weight on performance. We talked a little bit about weight and balance, which we'll see on day four. So, um, you know, as the weight increases, as you might expect, it's, if the airplane is a lot heavier, uh, it's a little harder for it to take off. Um, so some of these are kind of intuitive, but it is important to think about them because it is, you know, just because, you know, if you take a Cessna 172, it has four seats. You'll actually find that if you, if you fill that with, you know, four large people, um, you know, over 200 pounds each, your aircraft may not actually be able to safely take off. Um, and especially um, that's something you really need to consider and think about. So that's something we'll go into more on uh, day four. The only person who ever failed this class asked me if that was a self-portrait. I, I did take that picture at the Newport uh, Jazz Festival, but I was behind the camera, in case you were wondering. So uh, performance is, you know, also a lot related to what's the, the ground roll. There's a question in the chat earlier about the ground roll distance. So you can see that depicted here. And then what's the amount of distance needed to clear a 50 foot obstacle here in this case. So oftentimes there will be trees or buildings or something um, near an airport. And so this is very important to understand. Okay, so yeah, that ground roll versus uh, that, that there were some good questions about that. And part of the reason that the assignment was a little bit ambiguous was to get people to think about that. So if you go to some Caribbean islands, uh, you will often find you know, runways on these flat coral islands that are kind of built right up to the water on both edges. There's absolutely no obstacles of any kind. And in that case, you could actually look at just the ground roll. If you go to New Jersey, not to pick on New Jersey, but I hate, absolutely hate New Jersey. It has just a plethora of horrible airports with relatively small runways hemmed in by trees. And, uh, you know, for those kind of airports at which plenty of accidents actually have happened, uh, then you have to look at these uh, uh, 50 foot obstacle distances for both takeoff and landing because there's always obstacles all around. So that's really the difference. Here in New England, um, one example of a runway where you really don't need any of these obstacle clearances that you can think about, uh, Block Island, if you look at it, the airport's kind of up on a hill and it's a short runway, only 2,500 feet, but it's absolutely clear on both ends. Uh, Provincetown on the Cape is another pretty good example of an airport uh, that uh, you, know, you can approach from the water and there's nothing there, at least landing on runway seven. So anyway, this chart is pretty simple to interpret. Maybe somebody can uh, highlight the relevant field. Uh, so if you're taking off from sea level at gross weight temperature zero, that's really just the first, uh, the first uh, two numbers there. Um, so 1,287 is gonna be your ground roll, uh, but then we're gonna uh, adjust by 10% uh, for each 12 knots of headwind. So we happen to have 24 knots of headwind. And you see, um, you know, one, one thing I wanted people to see was headwind does help you, but tailwind really hurts you. Um, and I think that's because if you think about it, uh, the amount of energy you build up is mass times velocity squared. So if you're going just a little bit faster, it takes you a lot longer uh, time to lose that ground speed with the brakes or uh, you know via aerodynamic uh, drag on the ground so a big takeaway is that you know headwind is a little bit helpful tailwind is murderous we'll see that on the next one and density altitude is also murderous um, so let's go back if you can sorry back to one so we also asked there's a second question because it's the same chart i put the second question in there about uh, how long do you need to take off from denver so you can see in Denver, if you had any obstacles, you would need quite a long runway indeed. We had 2583. Yeah, somebody can highlight that one maybe. 5,000, Denver's approximately 5,000 feet. And uh, I said it was a hot summer day, 30 degrees. Um, now remember, this is also a perfect factory new airplane that was being tested. So uh, it'll take 2583 feet just to lift off 
and then you won't be at 50 feet above the ground until you're 3,600 uh, feet from where you started. Uh, and it's no accident that the main runway uh, at Denver is 16,000 feet long. That's, I think, the longest runway in the U.S. The space shuttle runway on which I landed, the Cirrus, um, in January as part of this aviation group that I'm in, uh, that's 15,000 feet long down in, uh, in Florida. So Denver's actually a little bit longer. Any, any questions on this about uh, takeoff performance before we move on? The answer uh, was yes. 10, the answer was ten thirty. Uh, uh, you know, there's no answer. Just like most questions in life, it could be ten thirty, or you could start with the eighteen forty eight number um, and uh, say, you know, it's an airport with some obstacles, like in that hellish state of New Jersey, and uh, we're going to start with eighteen forty eight and then multiply that one by point eight. So I, either one's fine. Okay, next. Tina, okay, yeah. So landing is this kind of the same dance. If you're gonna land at Block Island or somewhere in the Caribbean, you might be able to sneak the airplane in and land you know, right on the first foot of the runway, especially if you're in a piston powered airplane, you, you can never do that in a jet because you can't be, um, you don't have instant power available. So if you lose some of the headwind, uh, and therefore your airspeed, you can't touch it up uh, very effectively with power. Uh, but with a piston airplane, you know, maybe you could think about um, the ground roll number as being significant for a, um, for a landing at an airport with no obstacles. So here we see, uh, my favorite answer was 33, 24 feet at 3150 pounds. Um, so, this question was about this Cirrus that I usually fly, which uh, has a, a maximum landing weight of 2,900 pounds, <laughs> it's serial number 1522. So I'm thinking that somebody downloaded uh, a POH for a newer version of the SR20, where they uh, pumped up the uh, gross weight a little bit. That's the only way I can think of that they could come up with 3,324 uh, uh, pounds. Um, I'm still not sure that that's uh, even right. But anyway, uh, the answers range from 1,250 up to that 3,324. Uh, I do believe the correct answer is uh, 1,250 feet. A lot of people did get that. Um, and that's the ground roll, but you could also uh, find yourself needing about 2,600 feet. Uh, so you can see how you could get into trouble in New Jersey, not to hammer on that state again, as I know a lot of you love it. But if you look at Sky Vector or some other source of aeronautical charts, you'll go, you can go all over New Jersey and you can see how easy it would be to make a mistake in a Cirrus, even uh, a relatively slow one like the SR-20, because there's a lot of airports that are in that 2,500 foot uh, runway length range. They are surrounded by trees. And of course, you know, your pilot technique may not be perfect. So you really, uh, you know, I like to, work within the airline standards where you're gonna land within 60% of the available runway. Uh, so you actually, with a little bit of a tailwind, you know, you might want closer to a 4,000 foot runway to, to give yourself and your passengers a good safety margin if there's uh, trees all around. Uh, and again, just that's- to, what Just to clarify for folks, so there isn't one right answer. Philip is saying the right answer could be 1250 or it could be 2564. It depends on whether you're talking about um, a runway where there is this um, 50 foot obstacle or, or not or whether, you're, and so that's what he was trying to say, I think, right, Philip? Yeah, and then, you know, at a towered airport, you're probably not gonna land with a tailwind ever because you have a great source of information. They're gonna assign you to the runway. At a, near, a really tiny airport, you know, maybe all they have is a little wind sock that you have to look at from the air. Uh, maybe you're having a bad day. You know, it's possible you could find yourself landing with a, with a, with a tailwind. Uh, and six knots isn't that, uh, you know, isn't that much, but it has a big effect on, uh, on runway length. So another good reason to stick to that uh, airline rule of planning to land within 60% of the available runway. 
Right. So I think most folks get it, but just let me go back to, to clarify. So this picture is showing that this is the ground roll and then the airplane rotates or start, you know, it's not on the ground anymore and it's taking off, but it still has to uh, clear that obstacle. So that's what these two distances are showing. Um, so that's why that's the difference between ground roll and total here. Okay, great. So um, let so Philip has talked about this a bit. So just let me just double click on this point. So when you have a an airplane, you're landing. You land into the wind. You know why is that? Why do you land into the wind? Well, wind uh, going over your wings helps generate lift. And if um, and when you're landing, you're trying to slow down and come to a stop. So you want your um, so there's airspeed, which is related to the wind going over your wings, and then there's your ground speed, which is how fast you're going over the ground. And you want to be going over the ground slowly, because eventually you're trying to stop on the ground, but you still want air to go over your wings so that you're still generating lift and you don't stall. So that's why it's really helpful to land into the wind. So um, your airplane can be moving over the ground slowly, but still be generating lift. And so that's why it's always better um, to take off and land into the wind and why a tailwind, a wind coming uh, from behind you, is actually very bad and dangerous and can result in some, some very big issues. And so that's why you see at airport, you know, wind socks, wind indicators, you check the weather, you call in to get the local weather, you really need to know about the wind. Okay, or, so or or don't fly in New Jersey if you're landing on seven thousand feet at Hanscom Field. The tailwind uh, is not going to do uh, too much damage to your Cirrus uh, landing performance. You'll still you'll still make it off the runway about uh, midway down. Right. So we covered uh, quite a few things. Um, you guys saw four different lectures, and I know there was Q and A in those lectures as well. But I'm glad we were able to cover some of those things. Um, but today, today's day two, and it's all about the flight environment. So the lectures you're gonna watch today are about charts and airspace, the flight environment, navigation, uh, communication, and flight information. So it's talking yeah. radar and talking to air traffic controllers and that whole process. Let me address a few questions that came from the chat uh, session, Tina, if that's okay. Um, so people asked, um, what is the difference between um, cross country and regular flying? And I answered 50 nautical miles. Uh, so if you go from uh, Hanscom Field, for example, to Keene, New Hampshire, that's a 50 mile leg and that's considered cross country. Um, can it be multiple? That's a good question. I think at least one leg should be at least 50 nautical miles total. Um, I don't think there's a really good rule, but you can certainly hop your way back and that's fine. Um, somebody asked whether it's realistic to solo at 10 hours. Um, you know, I think you can functionally solo at 10 hours these days where the instructor doesn't have to do anything and that is flying. Uh, in the old days, people could get soloed at four hours, at eight hours. A friend of mine got soloed at eight hours. I think the reason that you're looking at these long times, you shouldn't feel discouraged, but people have just become very risk averse. Also at a towered airport, you know, there's more to learn about radio communications and procedures. So I think some people in the Midwest at a little quiet field with no tower, they may still solo in 10 hours, um, but it's, it's become uncommon because people, they want to see a perfect landing before they sign the, the student off to solo. Whereas in the old days, you know, the student could solo if uh, the landing, the previous landing hadn't broken anything. And what do we mean by solo? You know, your first solo, you never leave the vicinity of the airport. So you just, you just take off, you fly the traffic pattern and you do three landings and that's it. You don't, you don't even leave. So if there's a tower controller, you're constantly in communication. They cleared everyone away because they know you're kind of a, you know, uh, mystery as to how you're going to handle it. And uh, sometimes they even have uh, your 
your instructor, you know, they're not in the plane with you, they're not talking to you, but they might be in the tower, they might be observing uh, what you're doing. So it's not like the, it's not like solo means you're going off and flying to some destination. You're staying at your home local airport, you're never leaving the airport, and you're just doing three takeoffs and landings. But it is very exciting. When I did my first one, uh, the very first landing, you know, I was very focused on what I was doing, but it was amazing. I actually started singing uh, during my first solo. And it was just an amazing feeling to fly an airplane by yourself, have the ability to do that. It's just thrilling. And, and yeah, I think it is somewhere around 10 hours uh, for you to do that. Tina, can you kill the uh, screen share so people can see the videos better? Sure. Uh, somebody else asks, what are your thoughts on learning on multiple planes while getting the private, private pilot certificate? And they threw out the VA-40, which is a great airplane, the Cessna 172, which I've hardly ever flown, the Alpha Trainer. Um, I think uh, this kind of gets back to what I said about, you know, when it would be a good idea to fly a glass cockpit. You know, time and type is really valuable. And it takes, you know, even pretty experienced pilots five to 10 hours to transition to another aircraft uh, to get into a more, you know, complex aircraft. Insurance companies sometimes like to see 25 to 50 hours. So I think it's a, a really great idea if you can to stick with one type and, you know, just get so comfortable with it. It's like, uh, you know, putting on an old jacket uh, in the morning and every, you know, you kind of know where everything is uh, by feel. So I would say stick to one aircraft if you can. Um, there were some COVID questions yesterday about open cockpit uh, aircraft, like how can you fly? Um, with uh, a breeze uh, going through the cockpit. And uh, I think the most, I, I figured, I think I figured out that the most commonly available trainer airplanes that uh, where you can fly legally without a door and simply without a door are the Piper Cub, uh, which we saw that yellow one on an earlier slide, and the Aviat Husky, which is kind of like a modern uh, Piper Cub. So if you can find a flight school that's teaching tail draggers in the Piper Cub, remembering that Charles Yeager, uh, the big hero, ground looped, uh, I think it was a T6 um, in North Carolina uh, about 15 years ago, um, then uh, you can have the, uh, the open door experience. So I think those are the ones from the chat. Um, uh, well, we can keep going. We'll give you some more opportunities to ask questions. Um, I do want to introduce so the, the flight environment, and I'm going to do so in a way that you think might be a little bit silly, but we're going to sing the alphabet together. So don't let anyone tell you that MIT is too difficult. We just did the alphabet. So actually, if you will all unmute your microphones, um, you know, of course, in the world of aviation, we get, instead of saying A, B, C, Alpha, Bravo, so these types of terms so people can hear you. Okay, so now, everyone, now, all together. Alpha, Alpha, Alpha. Bravo, Bravo, Bravo. Bravo. Charlie, Delta, Echo, Truck, Alpha, India, 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 La Lima, Ike, Amber, Oscar, Oscar, Papa, Quebec, Azure, Sierra, Go. Uniform, Victor, Victor, all right, that was brilliant, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs> I think there's some people in China right now who are uh, having a lot of ear pain and holding their ears. <laughs> That was great. I think I think most of you got got it all. So that was great. If you if you don't know these, they're fun uh, to memorize, and then you can really uh, you know annoy some of your friends when you're just on a normal phone call. They ask you to you know spell out an email address. You use the phonetic alphabet. Um, it's actually extremely helpful. So um, I encourage you to have have fun today. Uh, you know, learning about the flight environment, communication with air traffic controllers.
and then we have posted the day two assignment. So here's the day two assignment link. Please uh, take a look at that. Give it a shot. Are there any more questions we can answer today before we wrap up? Yeah, yeah put them in the chat or uh, shout them out, I guess, since there's not a whole lot of people talking. Uh, I actually do have a question. Um, I, I imagine uh, that uh, the international students that, that grew up in metric uh, might have some, some difficulty uh, Wrapping their heads around uh, all these these imperial measurements of um, the runway, the speed. Uh, have you seen uh, like people like uh, from other countries having some difficulty adapting to to these units during flight school? To the units that Jesus wants everybody to use, you mean? Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I mean, foreigners come over here and. Uh, you know, I think, what, what difference does it make what the units are, right? You don't want to have your airspeed indicator uh, going below 50 knots while you're flying, for example. So does it really matter whether that's, uh, uh, you know, metric or whatever? It's, 50 is the number that you care about. So no, I don't think, the only real difference between flying internationally and here, I think, is the altimeter setting in millibars versus inches of mercury. And actually, sometimes also they'll give you, uh, I guess in some places they'll give you an altimeter setting such that the altimeter reads how far you are above the ground, not how far you are above sea level. That's another source of confusion. Other questions? So I was looking over the answers that we uh, placed in our previous homework and either I either, either we had the wrong POH but I'm not sure maybe I guess the uh, the VNE is always talked about as the never exceed so for that question about the maximum speed with and without flaps you're actually going to list the VNE speed because if you're never to exceed that speed wouldn't it be not even don't even get close to the speed like the red arc you're not even supposed to get close to it at all no you, if the air is smooth you can fly right up to uh right up to vne i mean you know remember these aircraft manufacturers they have to put in a certain amount of over design right the airplane if, if vne is 200 knots it can't come apart at 201 um but uh you don't want to fly through um you don't want to fly through rough air at uh you know, there's, for piston-powered aircraft, there's a yellow arc where you don't want to fly in uh, rough air. For turbine-powered aircraft, we don't have that. So, you know, I was flying the Pilatus back from Maine on Sunday and in the descent. I don't know, the VNE is 238 knots, and I was probably going 230, just trying to get uh, back home. So, nothing, that's, that's not uncommon to be, say, 10 knots below VNE. Somebody asked about the reference for the day two assignment. There really aren't any. I mean, there's a few things that we have in here. Uh, we did suggest skyvector.com if you want to look at aeronautical charts because it's free and it's web browser based and it's nice. And we also link to the FAA's aeronautical information manual and there's a URL for there. Uh, for the navigation section, there's really no reference other than maybe our PowerPoints or the FA books that uh, you've already got. So there was a question about uh, can you learn on a multi-engine? Um, I would I would say that's a kind of a dangerous proposition. <laughs> One that, of <laughs> that, that came up yesterday, and uh, somebody had a uh, a family member with a Beechcraft Baron, and the family member happened to be an instructor. And I said, absolutely, you know, the FAA, there's nothing magic about the Cessna 172 um, or a similar aircraft, single engine land as a first rating. So you can, your first pilot certificate can be in a hot air balloon. It could be in a multi-engine land aircraft. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna need a fair amount 
more training and the insurance company probably isn't going to like you soloing in a beachcraft bearing. So you got to be prepared to, to buy a new aircraft if uh, things go wrong during the solo. Um, Plus one of the things you have to learn with a multi-engine is how to handle a single engine failure. So you have, you're, you're still, you're flying on one engine and you're dealing with the torque associated uh, yeah, you'll be, with that. You'll be, flying, you'll be flying sideways in your single, in what has become a single engine land airplane. <laughs> so yes, it's, it's legal, but it's probably not, uh, not all that practical. I don't want you buying us lunch, Phil. <laughs> Is there a benefit starting from a very simple aircraft? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, Oksana points out the aerobatic champion, Oksana, who's here secretly posing as a uh, student, but she's actually a fully certificated pilot. She says, uh, you can start from a very simple aircraft and then move to complex, but this is not a regulation. So yes, Oksana is right. I have something to add to that. I started out in a uh, Citabra, so with conventional gear, and I thought that it would make me a better pilot, and I've sold in the Citabra now. The first time I flew a uh, tricycle aircraft, it was so easy. I mean, it was just ridiculous. <laughs> There's like no footwork involved. Right. The disadvantage of the Citabria, though, is if, uh, if your CFI is short in the seat behind you, uh, they might be troublesome during taxiing. We had the same question as, I think, yesterday uh, from Casey. Would you recommend getting a flight simulator? And uh, I thought we answered that yesterday, but maybe, uh, maybe Casey wasn't here. So basically, uh, flight simulators historically have been very helpful for uh, instrument training um, and uh, not all that useful, pretty inefficient for learning VFR flying skills. Somewhat useful, but uh, inefficient. Great, I, I have a little different perspective, Philip. So I think a flight simulator is great, especially, um, especially with this issue of you know, COVID and uh, a lot of the, the stay at home restrictions. The flight simulators have allowed me to to continue flying when it has been unsafe to do so in a real airplane. So, um, you know, there are a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, what you know, what I use is X plane, and um, I actually, unrelated to the flight sim, had gotten a, a VR headset, an HTC Vive. You know, there are plenty of others out there. I think the VR headset, yeah, I agree with Chris in the chat. I think the VR headset is, it's basically necessary <laughs> to do VFR flight with a simulator because the whole point of um, visual flight, as Philip said, is to look outside the airplane. You're not supposed to be looking at your flight controls, uh, especially when you talk about doing a, a landing pattern. All of it is about looking out the window. So uh, we've talked a little bit about the landing pattern, but essentially you fly alongside the runway, you overshoot the runway and you turn and you come back to land at it. And so all of those critical turns, you have to look out the, the window to see the runway below you. And you make the determinations about when to, to turn uh, your base leg um, and, and other things based on looking out the window and seeing the runway. It's not based on your altitude. It's not based on other things. It's based on what it looks like. And so with the VR headset, you can actually turn your head and look and see it. And it works, uh, it works pretty well. For, the, um, for instrument flight, I think, again, flight simulators are absolutely critical. They can save you a whole bunch of money uh, than in an airplane because you can keep resetting and learning what the instrument approach is like. So I'm, I'm a big fan of that. I know Microsoft Flight Simulator just came out with a new new release and so haven't tried that one yet. I'm on X-Plane right now, but there are a lot of great resources out there in terms of simulators and in this world of COVID especially, I recommend trying it out. I thought a flight simulator was great for trying out uh, different things, right, in a safe environment. So putting rudder in uh, and to trying to get a coordinated turn, just to try, you know, what if I do it this way or that way, or no, it didn't tell me exactly how much I had to put in in my plane, but it let me get a, some understanding of the, of the 
benefits and the disadvantages of doing it in different ways. <laughs> it's just on a tablet with X plane, nothing fancy. Absolutely. And um, actually, I also went ahead and splurged and I actually have a, a yoke um, and pedals and, uh, and the throttle. So you can actually have a whole, whole setup. Um, I don't think it's required, but it is certainly fun to do so. Uh, the other thing you can do with the flight sim is just, just play, especially in a glass cockpit, is just sit and play around with the darn thing because those things are very complicated and if the only time you're getting familiar with it is while you're paying for aircraft time and instructor time it can become <laughs> very expensive so uh, some flight schools even have that whole system sitting on a table at their flight school that you can play with um, but if you can do that in a simulator i think that's great so you can learn what the buttons and knobs do because that's kind of the, the biggest issue when uh, learning the g1000 All right. Well, without further ado, we've uh, we've hit the hour, so I want to let you get to the um, the lectures on the charts and the airspace and radar and ATC. And uh, similarly, um, folks, uh, if anyone would like to take over, so we can so if those who want to want to watch the lectures synchronously, let me know if there are any volunteers, and I can turn over the host control. You want to kill the recording? Yes. Good.